Hey everybody, how are you guys all doing this evening? Hopefully you guys can hear me loud and clear. If you guys wouldn't mind letting me know in the chat, I'd very much appreciate it. I was changing some settings on my mic today, so uh, apologize if you guys saw the um, the accidental test video that I released earlier. I was testing some audio settings and I didn't realize it went public, so... I noticed that like 40 people had watched it real quick or something. I, I intended for it to be private. It was just me saying test, test into the microphone. So right on. Um, so I hope that you guys are uh, doing okay where it's uh, cold. You know, uh, I think that's pretty much everywhere in the United States and Canada, except for uh, California and Florida. Uh, California, we've been getting some rain, but for us, cold is 50 degrees. So, you know. We don't really know what cold is, so I hope you guys are all doing okay. Right on. I'm glad you guys can hear me okay. Thanks for letting me know in the chat. I really appreciate it. Don't want to have a repeat of the video where nobody could hear me. That was a nightmare. So um, I'm going to do a little introduction here. I'm assuming that everybody knows who I am, okay? But, you know, my name is Chris. Uh, obviously, this is my channel, HVACR Videos. Um, I do a live stream uh, typically every Monday night at about 5 o'clock p.m., and um, I uh, just try to recap the, the videos from the previous week, okay? So I upload two videos a week on my channel, Monday and Friday, uh, typically really early in the morning. And then I just kind of do these live stream recaps to try to answer questions and stuff. A lot of you guys that are watching this in the chat and everything already know this stuff, but I know there's a few new people in here, so... Um, uh, do me a favor before I forget, guys. Uh, my buddy Isaiah is in the chat. He's... Uh, got a YouTube channel called HVAC with ZSA. Okay. Isaiah is a good kid. Um, if you don't already know, I'm going to post his channel name right there. Okay. You guys search that on YouTube. If you guys don't already know, I'd really appreciate you guys go over to his channel and give him a subscription. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not going to overstep my bounds here, Isaiah, but I'm just going to explain a little bit about you. Okay. Isaiah is a kid, uh, that is living with autism and he is working with his father trying to learn the trade. Uh, he's made a YouTube channel and he is trying to just grow his audience. Okay. He's, he, he give him, you know, be patient with him and, you know, just watch. He's just trying to share his experiences that he has. Okay. And I really appreciate his channel and I do like to watch it. So it would really, uh, mean a lot if you guys could go over and give his channel a subscription, leave him a comment, let him know what you guys think, leave him some nice, uh, nice comments there. That'd be really nice. Okay. So, um, you know, what I want to talk about right now is uh, I just kind of want to recap on my videos, okay? Um, just want to cover a few things, then I'll get to questions and different things in the chat, okay? Um, what, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the chat here too as I'm going. Yeah, Isaiah's really trying to hit a thousand subscribers, so he's almost there. So he's about just a little over halfway there. So, um, so my video that I released today was on a Kyrak Blue prep table. Okay, and I've done a few videos on these blue prep tables, but I always get these questions about them, and I just kind of want to um, answer some of the questions that I get about them. Okay, so the Gly or the the Kyrak glue, <laughs> Kyrak glue, the Kyrak blue prep table is essentially a tiny chiller. Okay, and what it does is we've got a normal condenser, but then we have a flat plate heat exchanger as the evaporator coil, and it's essentially just exchanging the heat. It's just uh, transferring the heat from the glycol, okay? So they've got a glycol pump on that unit that is circulating all the time, and it's pumping glycol into the base section and into the cold rail, okay? So on these little Kyrak regions, and it's the blue line, okay? Because they have a line before the blue, and I'll explain that in a minute. But their blue line is their glycol ones, okay? They do not circulate refrigerant in the evaporator and or the pan chiller. The only place that the refrigerant is at is in the condensing unit, and it stops at the flat plate heat exchanger. The flat plate heat exchanger is typically right behind the uh, condenser. Um, you have to take the back cover off the back of the box, and you can usually see it. It's all insulated up, so it's not anything you can take apart. And trust me, you don't want to take it apart unless you're looking for a leak, okay? Um, I have yet to find a leak on one of their flat plate heat exchangers. Um, they do have a common leak place, and that is typically on the suction service valve. Uh, going to the compressor, they typically leak right there. Or I have seen them on the liquid line receivers. Um, King valve packing has leaked a lot too, okay? But anyways, so the Kyrak Blue region was originally a redesign of Kyrak's um, original model 
which Kyrak released in the mid 90s and they were super popular in the early 2000s. They came out with the first what they called their uh, their, their pan chiller. chiller. And, and that was not a glycol, glycol model. model. That, that was just circulating air in refrigerant and it was a very, very good design, but it had some flaws in that the drains would constantly get plugged up on the older Kyrak regions, okay? Um, they were very, very efficient, though, and they were probably, even even with their problems with the drains plugging up, they were still uh, one of the best uh, innovative refrigerators for keeping product in the top section cold. They pretty much owned the industry, okay? Um, because they had a fan motor, they had a patent on their design, and it was just a great design. They redesigned things, came up with the blue line, okay? And what the blue line did, it's actually really interesting, is they exchanged, uh, or they put glycol and a, and a pump, basically. And what that does is it allows them to control the temperature a lot more evenly, okay? So there's no more fan motor up in the top section. It's just a couple rails with some glycol pumping through them, and then it pumps around the rails. And it maintains a really good even temperature on their pans up in the top. Um now, one of the flaws that they have, and this is something interesting, is, is that they adopted the Intellitrol control system. So Intellitrol was the control system that was um, uh, unique to Trollson. Trollson is a major refrigerator manufacturer. Pretty much they were one of the best, if not the best, for the longest time. And they came out with their Intellitrol line, and the Intellitrol line essentially was a smart defrost system. Uh, in it, it used sensors, and the weak spot on the Intellitrol module is the sensors. The sensors are constantly failing. So when Kyrak first designed their blue system, they came out with their own uh, patented you know, control system, but when they merged with Trollson, they got bought out by a company called Illinois Toolworks, um, and Illinois Toolworks just kind of gobbled up everybody. I believe they gobbled up Hobart. I could be wrong on that one, but I know they gobbled up Trollson, Kyrak, and then there's a bunch. They're, they're a conglomerate. They got tons of stuff. Okay, so when they did that, they um, they kind of you know consolidated some of their stuff, and then all of a sudden the Kyrak Blue regions adopted the Intellitrol module. Um, so what you're going to notice, and I, I got a lot of questions about this, is that the sensors, it, you still have a lot of the same methods as checking the sensors as on the Trollson units, but uh, they've reprogrammed the controls and basically took the Trollson controller and kind of made it their own, okay? Again, they're the sister company, they're the same kind of a thing, but... Um, so for instance, you know, the, the, the cabinet and the evaporator temperature, and then you have the liquid line temperature that was on the Trollson Intellitrol. Well, Kyrak has kind of changed it up and reprogrammed it and does something different. So, um, you know, when you see me scrolling through those inside the video, uh, you know, it's, it is a little bit different, but it still uses the same like passwords and different things to get into the controller. Okay. So, well, um, in my opinion, uh, the, the, again, this is just a bold statement, but in my opinion, the Kyrak blue system is probably one of the best refrigerators out there as far as prep tables go for the customer. Now they, every refrigerator has its problems and that's just my opinion. Okay. A lot of people may say they don't like them. I just like them because they have a really good, even temperature and the problems are very, very predictable. Uh, it's really interesting too, because earlier in the chat, we were discussing how, um, I tend to notice that I get service calls in waves. So like lately I've been working on a lot of these Kyrak blue systems and then I'll go for months without working on them. Uh, you know, I'll be working on something else. It's just kind of funny how it happens. I'll get a bunch of ice machine calls all of a sudden, and then I'll be doing reach in calls and whatnot. So anyways, back to the, the operation of the Kyrak unit. So, um, there's three sensors on the Kyrak blue unit. Okay. There's a red sensor. Uh, I'm sorry. There's a green sensor, a blue sensor and a yellow sensor. So the yellow sensor is under the LL, um, what do you want to call it? Um, feature inside the controller. Okay. And in on a Trollson, that would be the liquid line sensor, but that is not what it's being used as on the Kyrak units. Okay. The LL sensor is the air temperature sensor inside the box that has no operation on how the box works. Literally, that is just a display for the customer to see a digital thermometer readout. Okay. So that sensor does not affect the operation of the unit. Then you have your green and your blue. Okay. The green sensor is a uh, is the temperature controlling sensor okay so that one controls the temperature of the box and the blue sensor is the defrost sensor so factory those sensors are mounted uh, up against um, the evaporator or the pan chiller the cold rail up on the top and they're encapsulated in, in foam and so what happens is, is when the sensors do fail the factory advises you to 
go ahead and relocate the sensors into the glycol bath, okay? So they tell you that the operation will be just fine. It'll still defrost like it's supposed to and everything. So like you saw in the video, what I do is I take the two sensors, I use the zip ties to make it nice and straight. It's kind of difficult to fish it all the way down because you have to get it all the way into that copper T at the bottom of that glycol reservoir, okay? You have to make sure it's down there because if it's not... Um, it becomes a problem. And another really good tip is when you do that, you need to zip tie the sensor wires so they don't get accidentally tugged out. And then also, like I showed in the video, you want to, I usually take electrical tape and bundle it up on the bottom side. So that way that's another added um, safety precaution to make sure the sensors don't get yanked out of there. Okay. So um, there's really not a whole lot they're, they're, they're really not that difficult, the reach-ins, okay? They're pretty simple. Um, you really shouldn't have to get into the features. They give you a very limited temperature control range, as in I think like some of them they go down to 25 degrees and then they'll go up to 30 and that's it. That's all they give you adjustment range. Now, if you got into the engineering settings in that control, excuse me, I'm sure you can change the settings, but I'd advise you guys not to, okay? Um, another thing that I got in the uh on a flip i'm sorry let me go back to the kyrak thing one of the cool things too is they use the the identical sensor as the trollson units so if you stock the trollson sensors they'll work just fine on the kyrak regions okay um they do have a different part number but they're the same sensor so you can use them interchangeably but you do not want to use a trollson controller on the kyrak unit because they are programmed a little bit different okay um just, you know, contact Kyrak and talk to them, okay? It's funny because when you call Kyrak, you actually call Trollson first, and then you have to hit the switchboard for Kyrak, and then you talk to tech support. So now that I said tech support, I want to talk about technical support here for a minute. Um, I will lean on technical support whenever I have questions, okay? Um, I There's a lot of feedback back and forth inside the... Uh, inside the the chat and the questions and different things about people saying that they don't use tech support they've never used tech support all that good stuff okay um i don't know that uh that um sorry i'm just i'm looking at uh the chat real quick guys sorry i got my you guys can see right you can see me for some reason in the uh on the video it wasn't showing me there so i want to make sure that i can be seen here the chat okay, yeah i can see myself all right cool that's good all right so um so i got a little distracted there real quick and let me change this let me turn that off and transition, transition that over perfect, perfect. okay sorry, sorry about, about that, that. Um, um i got, got a little scared because I, I looked at my screen and it didn't, didn't show my face so then i was kind of panicking, panicking thinking that couldn't, couldn't see myself but we are good to go, go. So, um, but like I was saying, you can use the same sensors between the Charlesons and the Kyrax, so that's a plus, okay? Um, now I want to talk about tech support like I was going at. It's okay to lean on technical support. Uh, Thanasis, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. I'll, uh, I'll hit your question here in just a minute, okay? Um, I'll go back up to the questions and check them out. So, uh, so technical support, there's nothing wrong with calling technical support, okay? But what I suggest you guys do um, is... Always lean on your supervisor, your senior service technician, or your service manager, you know, first, okay? In my opinion, because coming from my perspective, I'm a business owner, and my position in the company, uh, I, I co-own the company with my dad. My position is, is I handle the field, I handle the service. When I find out that my technicians are struggling on something, and they've been on something for hours and hours, and... You know, that, that's frustrating. So I really w appreciate, and I know your service managers appreciate too, that you guys communicate with them, okay? Um, I'm not saying don't call technical support, but I'm saying you always want to let your service manager know, you know, hey, this is what's going on. I'm going to go ahead and give tech support a call. And just, just so that they know you're having a hard time, okay? I suggest that because I would appreciate that when people call, okay? So nothing wrong with technical support, guys, okay? But at the same time, if your service manager, your senior manager, another tech at your company can answer the question before you blow up service or before you blow up the tech support phone number, that's probably the best thing because those tech support guys are getting a million calls a day, and most of them are probably pretty silly calls, you know. So, you know, I suggest you have all your ducks in a row when you do call them. All right, I've told many stories about this before being hung up by tech on tech or being hung up by tech support being hung up on by tech support because I didn't know the answer to a question and different things. And while that was frustrating and while that guy was kind of a jerk at the same time, I get it because he's getting a million phone calls a day. Okay. 
but there's not, don't be ashamed to call technical support. What I usually call technical support on is, is when I'm doing a warranty repair, because I like to keep them in the loop. I like to get their advice when I'm doing warranty repairs, because as a business owner, if you guys don't have to deal with that warranty repairs, kick you in the butt. So, um, you usually don't get paid very well. So you want to follow everything to a T and that's why I usually call tech support and say, Hey, I'm doing this. I found this. Are you guys cool with me doing this? And usually they're like, yeah, go ahead. But I just like it because they always put notes in their computers. Okay. The other cool thing about technical support is, is if you call them with models and serial numbers, um, usually depending on the manufacturer, they have notes in the system about the previous repairs. So if you have questions about how the unit's working, you can say, Hey, you know, what are the, what are the previous repairs on this thing? What did they do? You know, and, and that can give you some guidance if you're trying to troubleshoot a really difficult problem. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with calling tech support, but I suggest you lean on your service manager or your senior manager, whoever at your company first, and then give tech support a call. Okay. Um, Kyrak does have a really, really good technical support department. Um, uh, the guy that I always get, uh, his name is Robert. He's a really, really nice guy. Uh, very informative, but I usually don't, you know, call him with silly questions. I call him with with real questions. Like today I called to pick his brain before I did this, this stream to make sure that what I was about to say was correct because I had assumptions on how the box worked, but I just wanted to run a few things by, you know, and he confirmed, yeah, this is how this works. And, you know, so, you know, I called with a real question and, and he got, you know, got right to the point and didn't sit there and dance around. Okay. So I think that's always a great idea. Um, I'm going to go to the chat for a few minutes and then I'll come back and talk about a few more things too. Okay. So let me go back up here to, uh, Thanasis Brotsis, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, but you said, how do we do a proper leak test with a leak detector? Should we have a certain refrigerant pressure? Okay, so um, I kind of referenced this, and actually I'm glad you brought that question up because I did get some questions about this. Okay, so first off, if you're doing a leak check on a system, you want to make sure that you have pressure in all sides of the system, especially the ones that you're leak checking. And what I mean is, is let's say I'm working on my um, custom cook drawers that I released on Friday. Okay. And I mentioned in that video that before I did the leak test, what I did was I made sure that the thermostat was calling. Okay. Once the thermostat was calling, I went onto the roof, shut off the condensing unit, then equalized my gauges out. Okay. By doing that, what I did was I took the high pressure from the high side and bled it into the low side. So I brought the pressure of the low side up even higher than it was at because it was probably running at like 30, 40 PSI because it was 404A, okay? So that was, you know, somewhere in the range of where it should have been. So by taking the high side pressure and bleeding it into the low side, then I equalized out my gauges and um, I was able to do a leak test on the system without having to add nitrogen or anything um, and had pressure on both sides of the system. There's nothing worse for me as a manager you know, a person that people are calling for tech for help then to ask questions and find out a half an hour later from a tech that says, yeah, I was leak checking the system. Everything was good. And then I ask them, so was the system calling before you leak checked it? Well, no, it was pumped down. Well, then if you were leak checking the low side of the system and it's pumped down, what is that doing? Okay. So let's go to this. Let's talk about pump down. So we've got a compressor that's running. Uh, we're talking about a refrigeration system with a receiver, sight glass, a TXV, and a solenoid valve downstairs, okay? So the solenoid valve will energize whenever the system calls for cooling, okay? So the box temperature gets high enough, the temperature controller turns on the solenoid valve. The solenoid valve opens, lets pressure run through the system, runs all the way up to the compressor, brings the low side pressure up high enough that the low pressure control turns the system on and the system runs, okay? Now, the box will run and run and run until the box temperature comes down. Then the thermostat is gonna say, hey, it's cold enough in here, turn off that liquid line solenoid valve. So it'll turn off the liquid line solenoid valve. Then all of a sudden, no more refrigerant will pass through that liquid line solenoid valve, but the compressor will continue to run and run. So as it's doing so, the suction pressure inside the compressor is gonna get lower and lower and lower because no refrigerant is being let through that liquid line solenoid valve. So eventually it's gonna get low enough that the compressor is gonna shut off on low pressure. So that means that the low pressure safety control sees that the pressure's at, let's just say five PSI, and it says, oh, okay, I'm gonna turn off now. Well, what happens if we go to do a leak test on that system when the pressure's at five PSI? Unless it's a giant leak, we might not find it. Okay, so that's why it's important to shut off the system, equalize out the pressures, then do a leak test. Another really important thing to think about is, is when you're working on freezers, 
or even some coolers, sometimes the power from the roof might energize or de-energize the solenoid valve downstairs. So if you shut off the power on the roof and still equalize out your gauges, depending on where they're located, you just you, it may not put pressure into the right area of the low side. So you need to understand what you're working on, okay? I hate to say this and I don't want to offend anybody, but you really shouldn't be working on these systems if you don't understand the sequence of operation. Okay, you really shouldn't be going into it. You really should understand the sequence of operation before you start diagnosing, diagnosing troubleshooting, leak, leak checking, and all that, that good stuff. stuff okay? okay, that, that is, is a really, really, really good thing to learn when you're doing preventative maintenance. maintenance. Then, then you can, can lean on your service, service manager and ask them, hey, how does this box work? Because there's nothing worse than you spending hours working on the box to find out that it was just simply because you didn't know the sequence of operation that you spent, you know, two extra hours working on it. Okay. So I'm um, going to go back down here to the, the chat. Okay, so um, yes, Rad Ziok, you said you can use a solenoid magnet. Yes, you can. That is a great thing. Now, remember, a solenoid magnet is a great tool to open up a solenoid valve. Okay, I've used them in my videos before, and essentially it's very similar as equalizing out your gauges. Again, but you have to understand how the system operates. If you understand the sequence of operation, then you know that that solenoid valve is going to be closed when it's in the off cycle or when it's in pump down mode, okay? So keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind too, there's some funky systems out there. I deal with most light, light commercial and restaurant stuff, but there's some systems where the solenoids operate in reverse, okay? So you need to understand what you're working on, all right? Nothing worse than that. Okay, going to go back up here. Um, Okay. You're getting crazy feedback. Hmm. You guys still getting feedback right now? That's interesting. I don't think there's anything going on. Can you guys hear me okay right now? Was there feedback for a minute? I want to make sure before I go off talking forever. Yes, I do own my own company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, there, there might be something that I need to change or something like that, guys. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep on going here. Hopefully you guys can hear these. Uh, okay, let's keep going up into here. And I'm going to go answer some questions here, guys. So let me go back up into here. Hmm. I shouldn't be getting any audio feedback, guys. I don't have any audio feedback there. You guys still getting feedback? Hmm. How about that? Can you guys hear me right now? Okay, it's gone now. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I didn't do anything, but maybe there's something wrong with my stream or something. Okay. Yeah, there is no FX knob on my mixer. It's a it's a very complicated mixer, roadcaster mixer. So very, very complicated. But okay, so I'm gonna go back up into here real quick. It seems like these streams always have a problem where we always have something going on here. Okay. Um let me go back up into here and see what else I'm missing. If I missed okay, cool. If I missed any uh any more questions, guys, let's throw them down into the chat again so we can hear some more, okay? Okay, yeah, I apologize about that. I'll try to figure that out. Um, so Matt Cassano, you said, have I seen a clogged condenser? Oh, yeah. Now, what do you mean by clogged? Like dirty or restricted condenser? Um, I have never physically seen a restricted condenser myself. Um, I've seen restricted capillary tubes, and I've had oil-logged condensers, but I've never had a restricted condenser. So, Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going back up into here. All right. Yes. Uh, Sackman do. Um, yes, I have worked on cool tech refrigeration out of Pomona. Uh, it's been a while since I've worked on their stuff. I've only worked on their refrigeration racks. I've never worked on their regions. So, but I have worked on those. Um, Sackman do. I have a question for you. Can you email me at hvacrvideos at gmail.com? I want to ask you about something with cool tech. I've always had a, a curious 
question about them. So I want to know what's up. So send me an email. I'd like to talk to you about that. So yeah, I restricted Mike. Okay. Um, yeah, I should call tech support on audio equipment. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, yeah. So if anybody else has any more questions, let's throw them down into the chat here and let's go. I might have to throw this road, uh, roadcaster pro mixer away or road pro mac or whatever i got i got one of these roadcaster things and it's been i actually already just send it back once so um okay okay so field piece s man 460 versus the yellow jacket titan 4 pros i haven't used the titan 4s i'm a field piece fan uh so yeah i probably wouldn't be the right person to ask uh you may want to lean on uh hvac shop talk zach's worked with both of those so he may have a better opinion on those or maybe some guys here in the chat could have an opinion on how the titans work so um okay frank campbell what is the tall tool looking thing okay with the gauge off the top all right so hold on i'm gonna lean back and grab it This guy right here is old school. This is how we used to, actually, I never used this, so I shouldn't say we. This is how they used to uh, dial in a charge. It's called a dial a charge, okay? So you would fill uh, the refrigerant and the liquid refrigerant, you would be able to tell how much refrigerant. This was before scales were, were very um, accurate, and you could use these to dial in the very, very small minor charges, okay? There's some guys in here that may have used them, um, and they could probably enlighten you a little bit more, but I like to collect old tools. So yeah, this is an old dial a charge. So way before my time. This one's pretty cool too. This is an old school hermetic compressor analyzer. If you guys have never used one of these before, this is one of the original Annie's that you could use. So essentially it has multiple capacitors inside of it and you could, uh, test starting test a compressor basically by simulating uh, new starting components so if you thought you had a bad compressor or possibly bad starting components you could start it with this first we still have these today but um this is just an old one one of the old guy one of the guys that used to work for me his dad had picked it up at a garage sale and he gave it to me because he knew i liked these old tools yeah they, they, those dial of charges definitely are old school so um, do I ever work on industrial humidifiers? No, I do not. Uh, I have never worked on a humidifier. We really don't have the need for humidifiers here in Southern California because we have very dry air. So never had the need for that. Um, you know, another thing too, let me grab another one. Hold on. So this was my Annie that I use. This was my hermetic analyzer. Let me open this up. This is the one that I came up using. So basically, instead of throwing on a three in one to test to see if the compressor still works, we would use this analyzer. The cool thing about this was you could test the, you know, it has a ohm meter on it. So you can uh, test continuity to ground. You can test the windings and different things. So this was a, uh, like I said, this was the one that I used to use. I have no need for them anymore because our, uh, our, our meters, you know, we can have like the field piece meters and they have a really good capacitor tester on them and, you know, we can test the relays really easily. So there's still a need. Dave, if he's still in here, has one, you have, what do you call yours, Dave? Um, he's got his little compressor starter or whatever that he manually starts the compressors with. I like yours. I, I wish I can come up on one of those. That'd be a pretty cool one just to have. So, yeah, that is one of the old Annie's tech, total tech. Yeah, the, um, I believe it is made by thermal engineering too. Yeah, I'll have to look at it later. So, um, okay, so let's, uh, let's see if I have any more questions here and we'll see a multimeter, what kind and what type. So again, I'm a field piece fan. So I have. In my tool bag, the field piece SC660, which is their clamp meter that has every single function in the world on it. Uh, what I really, really like the 660 for is it has uh, 
phase rotation on it. So when you're doing startup, a lot of our equipment has three phase scroll compressors now. And before we would constantly start them up and then, uh, and then test, you know, listen to the sound, look at the gauge pressures, that kind of stuff to see if it was going in the right direction. Well, the cool thing about the SC660 is, is you can do phase rotation and basically you test all three legs and it tells you if you have it wired in an ABC sequence or a one, two, three sequence. So you know that it's correct. So I really like the field piece SC660. That's a really cool meter. Plus it does everything else that you ever needed to do. It's a little bit big, but it fits in my Vito Pro Pack just fine. So um, if you're using a small, small little bag, yeah, the, the SC660 is probably a little too big to be carrying with you, but I think it's still a good meter to have in your truck. So, um, okay. Yeah. The start cord. That's right. Yeah. Total tech that Dave has. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, how do I go about changing reversing valves? Paul Dieter, you ask, um, cut them out as best as possible. You know, it, reversing valves are never easy for anybody. So I try to cut them out. And then, uh, you know, then unbraze little sections at a time if you can. There's really no sweet way to do it. If you're working on a resi system, you're probably a little bit lucky because you can usually pull the condenser and, you know, work without the condenser there. But on package units, it's a little bit harder, especially if you're working on water source heat pumps. Those are a nightmare because they're usually in an attic and there's no access to them. I don't do any water source heat pump work anymore, but I used to do a lot of hospital work. And it seemed like the installers never even thought about someone uh, who had to work on those units. So I couldn't imagine changing, a uh, a reversing valve on a water source heat pump. So John Carter, you can't get a job making more than $12. Why been in the field for four years? Well, John, uh, first off, you need to look at yourself. No offense. Uh, I don't know if there's something about you that's not warranting you to make more money. Are you not growing? Are you not excelling? Are you not learning? If it's not you, then you need to move on to a different company. But I don't know what area you're in. Um, you know, Southern California uh, apprentices will start at eh, 15 to 18 an hour, somewhere in there. Um, but, you know, it all depends. It all depends. And it depends on you and how much you're excelling. But again, it could always be the company, too. So it might be better to move on to a different company if you're not going to grow any further. It also depends on the market you're in. You know, you get into commercial refrigeration, light commercial stuff like I do. You know, you can start making a lot more money. So it just depends, but you have to have the skills and you have to be able to move and work in the environment. You know, HVAC is, is difficult, especially when you get into refrigeration. So, okay. I keep going down here. Yeah, Brian, uh, the, the SC 660 is totally worth it, dude. Um, very, very good meter. And, uh, I actually have had it for quite a while and then I just dropped mine and it broke the clamp and I took it into field piece and they totally hooked me up and replaced it. No sweat. So. And it was my bad too, but they replaced it. Okay. Um, what's the best way you can practice the trade? RJ, you're in the engineering department in a hotel and currently going to school for HVAC. Should you practice in the hotel while you're in or join? Okay. So, I mean, read, obviously, lots and lots of books. Uh, I would suggest, I mean, if you have the ability to shadow someone in the hotel that you're working in, then, then do so. I mean, if you do not have someone to learn from, then I don't suggest you start twisting and pushing buttons because, uh, you could break things depending on the kind of equipment you guys have at the hotel. So I would highly suggest that you shadow someone or get a job with someone where you can do a proper apprenticeship and learn, um, you know, uh, and, and work with someone. And, you know, ideally I'd like to see someone ride with someone for a year at a minimum. I mean, I'm sure I'd like to see him longer, but as a business owner, it's, it's kind of difficult these days to be paying people so much to ride, you know, to, to have a proper apprenticeship for three years. That's like almost impossible. Um, so, you know, uh, at least a year, six months at the minimum, you know, you need to ride with someone and learn, but, and then understand that, you know, you're, you're not going to know everything when after the six months or a year's up, you're going to need to still continue to learn. So, um, okay, keep going. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, Pychik. I, sorry guys, if I butcher your names here. So, all right. Um, Ooh, okay. Prime time. One of your clients, his boy took an ice pick to the evap coil today. Yeah. It didn't end well for the coil or the boy. He did it because the coil was bit iced over. Yeah. I have had that. I had a manager one time that, um, 
let's say he was a little bit on the cheaper side and he did not want to call us and he thought he could defrost the coil himself with a steak knife and he was chipping the ice away and uh, there was three holes in the evaporator coil where you could see nice steak knives. So needless to say, that was an overtime emergency evaporator coil replacement and the facilities department at that particular restaurant chain was not too happy that they had to spend $8,000 or whatever it was, a lot of money. I know it was, that was like 10 years ago though, but they had to spend a lot of money to change an evaporator coil on the quick because someone decided they wanted to defrost it themselves. So not a fun thing. Uh, you know, it, I, I try to tell people, even when they're working with me, man, don't ever take anything to an evaporator coil other than water or heat to try to defrost it because you're just going to cause a problem. So all right, keep going down here, seeing what I'm missing. Sorry about that, Pisic. Okay, cool, right on. Um, yeah, Gary Black, I use an oxyacetylene torch. Um, never had a B tank, to be honest with you. They're too loud and they drive me nuts. So oxyacetylene all day long. Um, you know, but I guess, you know, that's just a personal preference. Uh, you know, I've, I see the, the convenience of a B tank because especially if you're having to climb up onto an attic, uh, if you have that turbo torch tip and you don't have to have an oxygen tank up there with you, that's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, climbing into weird places, I can see a B tank being very convenient. So, um, Freddie Neve Neves, uh, it's HVACR videos at gmail.com. Anybody have any questions? You just look in the show notes of the video, the main page, and it'll, it'll have my email and it's everywhere. So I'll put it in here right now. At gmail.com. There you go. Anybody can send me email questions, anything like that. Um, okay. How about setting on it? Uh, oh, what's the settings at? Um, Gary, send me an email. I'd rather not throw that in the chat. Uh, that's kind of one of the DIY things that I don't want to disclose for safety reasons. I don't want to tell someone what they should set their settings at because I don't want anybody to get hurt and then try to say it was me that taught them how to do that. So um, what I will tell you is, is that when you have a torch tip on an oxyacetylene, um, it usually tells you in the, the documentation on the torch tip. Uh, so if you're using a number two tip, which is typically what I run on my oxyacetylene rig, uh, the package that you buy with the number two tip tells you what to set the pressures at for that tip. So um, yeah, I just don't want to leave that into a video here. Um, you know, but I, I would say you can send me an email. And we can talk about it a little bit more. Um, Joel Monegro would be good to talk about. I don't know what you're saying there. Did you say switch? Uh, clarify that for me, Joel. So that way I can understand. Would I use the turbo turbo torch? Uh, I would try it, Paul. I, I guess I wouldn't hurt. I would give it a shot. Um, What can you do to cover your butt? Is it Xander? I'm assuming that's your name. Xander Clements. You said you got an ice machine when you arrived is making ice and it's working fine. I watched it for eight cycles. You check pressures, amp draws, check the order of operations. What can you do to cover your butt? Really simple. Do a production test on that ice machine. You do a production test. You find out how much ice the ice machine is supposed to produce. And then you prove that by measuring the amount of ice that it's producing at the moment. That is your best way. So, um, you know, and then once you do a production test, that'll answer a lot of your questions to tell you if the refrigeration system's working, uh, you know, do some troubleshooting. Think about it. Are they complaining only at nighttime when it's cold outside that it's not working? Uh, is it ever off on a safety limit that they're resetting? I don't know what brand you're working on. Uh, you know, it could be a refrigerant problem where the headmaster goes to bypass at nighttime and there's not enough refrigerant to properly flood the condenser and then it starves the evaporator coil. So that could be a low charge issue. Uh, it could be an intermittent um, hot water mixing valve inside the building that is is bypassing and you'll tend to see hot water mixing valves become a problem at nighttime when nobody's using any building water because the ice machine is still running even though nobody's in the building so then all of a sudden the ice machine will get hot water going to it and then it'll go off on a safety or have low production because it's got hot water but then when you get there in the morning um, you know the 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 whole building's running, they're flushing toilets, they're washing dishes and all that stuff. So then the hot water goes to everything else but the ice machine. So that's an interesting uh, 
problem that you can run into is, is a bad mixing valve. The best thing you can do to diagnose a mixing valve that's bad is, is be the first person to walk in the building, find out when they're going to be there, walk to the, uh, the hand washing sink, usually closest to the ice machine and turn it on cold water and stick your hand under it. If it doesn't have a manual mixing valve underneath the sink, a lot of the old restaurants used to have a common mixing valve that went to multiple sinks. So you grab that sink closest to the ice machine, turn on the cold water and stick your hand under it. If it's, you know, really, really hot water coming out the cold water faucet. And then all of a sudden, after a minute or two, it gets cold. Then that's uh, uh, an indication of a bad mixing valve somewhere in the building uh, that can cause intermittent ice machine problems. So I don't know if that's your case. That's just one of those things that popped in my head right now. So, okay. Uh, Chris Lopez, can I explain how to do a triple evacuation? So there's a lot of controversy about triple evacuations right now. And the triple evacuation is using the concept of vacuuming down to a certain level, purging with what we used to call dry nitrogen, then vacuuming down again, then purging with dry nitrogen again, and then vacuuming down again. Well, it's since been kind of debunked, the whole triple evac thing. And a triple evacuation isn't necessarily very um, useful. Okay. Uh, we basically can use a proper evacuation rig and a micron gauge, and we can do everything that a triple evac was going to do. Okay. So if you properly dehydrate the system, vacuum it down, the triple evac really doesn't do a whole lot. Now, um, I don't want to get into arguments about that. That's just my understanding of how things work. I am not the sergeant of the vacuum police. Okay. So don't, quote me on that stuff. But yeah, the triple evac really isn't your best bet. Okay. Now it's one thing if you are trying to push like a lot of moisture out of a system, I could understand a, va uh, a nitrogen purge doing that. But for the purposes of a triple evac, eh, I don't really know if that's really going to do a whole lot about that. Um, what I would suggest you do is um, I send me an email hvacrvideos at gmail.com and I will get you in touch with the proper people that can give you some more information about doing a proper evacuation. And in fact, I will go ahead and disclose that I am going to be working with some new vacuum tools that have come out hopefully soon. And, um, I will do some videos on proper evacuations and that, you know, we'll, we'll work on that. Okay. But it's going to be a little while. We've got some interesting videos coming up too. So, Okay. Let me keep going back up into here. Uh, guys, if I'm missing comments, there's so many now that I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning. So you guys need to throw them back in here. Scott, thank you so very much, dude. I really appreciate it, man. That really does help a lot. So much appreciated. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, Gary Black, I'm glad you pointed out that I, I really am enjoy, enjoying the M12 uh, fuel little uh, drill driver. And I'm probably going get, to end up getting one of their little impacts because I've heard they've got some pretty cool impacts too. I'm not a fan of the impact um, for taking screws off and stuff, but there is a purpose for it. So we'll definitely do that. Andrew, thank you so very much, dude. Um, okay, going to go back up into here. Again, guys, if I missed your comments, please throw them down into the bottom and I'll answer your questions as best as possible. So, okay. Um, yeah, prime time. That mom and pop restaurant where I had to run a new line set, that wasn't a, a, a pain in the butt. And it was even worse because it's kind of a, it's not a family friend, but it's a business acquaintance that we've had for a very, very long time. It's one of my dad's good friends as far as business goes. Um, so, you know, we tried to help the guy out as much as possible, but still that cost him an arm and a leg. Um, but he's a small mom and pop. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a nightmare of a service call. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the video where, good gosh, it was a long time ago, um, where... I had to run a new line set, uh, went there to change a coil, then found the line set was leaking underground. We ended up changing like a couple coils and multiple line sets. We had to run them down into the building. It was not the prettiest work in the world, but, uh, you know, we were trying to help the customer out. So we tried to keep it as low cost as possible to try to help the guy out. So that was a disaster job. Okay. Keep going back up into here. Gordon, thank you so very much, man. Hi, really appreciate you watching. Okay. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about, Gary, the M12 four-speed impact. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I definitely want to check that out. So, And hopefully, I will have some Milwaukee giveaways coming soon, guys. So hopefully, I'll be able to come up with some stuff that we can do a giveaway on. So I'm working on that one right now. Okay, so um, 
R R S King S G one. How does my company go about doing preventative maintenance? Well, it all depends on the customer. So I do restaurant refrigeration and it all depends on what the customer wants to do as far as the preventative maintenance goes. Okay. So in a perfect world, I want to do a preventative maintenance at a restaurant every month and I want to focus on a different thing every month. Typically don't want to change the air filters unless they're absolutely needed every month. I usually like to do every three months. I'll put in pleated filters. They last a lot longer. And then that way I can focus my preventative maintenances in a perfect world. If I have my say in it are going to last four to six hours per location. Um, and we just go through the equipment, you know, with a fine tooth comb and we try to maintain it. Once you get equipment into good shape, it's, it's fairly easy to maintain. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Most of my customers don't do a monthly preventative maintenance. I only have one of them that does a really good monthly maintenance. Um, so, and it's a very big restaurant. So it's, it's, it's almost not enough. You almost need to do two maintenances a month to keep up with the amount of stuff that they have going on. So, um, but yeah, we like to go through the equipment and you like to, it's in my opinion, it's best if you can have the same service technician going to the same restaurant every month, because then he starts to notice a trend when he starts to hear weird noises and different things. I think that, um, and I will go off on a high horse here real quick and start talking. And I mentioned it in one of my videos. I don't know if I released that video yet, but I have a problem with headphones when you're working, okay? I feel that you shouldn't be wearing headphones. I feel that you should be paying attention to the job, okay? Personal opinion. I know some of you wear headphones, listen to podcasts and whatever, okay? But I feel that when you're doing a preventative maintenance, even though it could be mundane and boring, that you need to be vigilant and listening to everything because that's how you diagnose and find work for yourself later, when you're there doing the preventative maintenance and you can hear a condenser fan motor across the roof going bad, you bring that up to them. You save yourself a call back out to that restaurant or you're already there. Maybe you could do it that time. Maybe you can't, but, um, also it's a safety thing wearing headphones in my opinion. Okay. Um, you know, you can't hear things behind you. If someone comes up behind you is trying to get your attention because there's a fire or whatever, you know, and headphones, they, they limit the ability to be able to hear things. Okay. So, um, sorry, went off on a tangent there, but Okay, I'm going to go into here and see what else is going on, what else I'm missing. Um, Yeah, I have the field piece wireless scale. It's really cool. And uh, let me show you guys something else too. Hold on. So I have talked to you guys about the new S-Man that's coming out. And this is Field Piece's new S Man. I've showed it in my videos. This is just the packaging. They're, they're, they sent it out. Um, the cool thing about this new S Man, one of the interesting things is, and that's, you know, manifold's not for everybody, but the cool thing about this is it has the ability to connect to the uh, wireless job link system. And it also has the ability to connect to their wireless scale and have the readings displayed on the manifold. So you can actually see what's going on with the wireless scale pounds and ounces as you're charging and you don't have to look down at your scale or your phone or whatever. So one cool thing I like about, well, one of the many cool things I like about the new field piece manifold. So, okay. Keep going into here. Um, heck yeah. I, I would expect trainees to read schematics while they're in school. They, they need to learn, you know, for sure. And I think that as an apprentice, um, your job doesn't end when you clock out. I think that it's your responsibility to go home and take down models and serial numbers while you're on the roof and do research when you go home, print out schematics, print out sequence of operation, do that kind of stuff and learn, you know, you're, you're not going to, you're, you're just going to excel that much faster if you, if you take the time after work and read that stuff. So, um, yes, I hear, I see Brian Milburn saying, get the, the book commercial refrigeration for air conditioning technician technicians by dick Wurz. it is a great great book hold on i need to have everything with an arm's length this is the book commercial refrigeration for air conditioning technicians by dick Wurz. great book uh dick Wurz is a very very nice guy he's a, a former business owner uh, started teaching and then started writing books. He's a great, great guy. Very good wealth of knowledge. This book has some great, um, uh, review questions in it. And it it just goes about teaching you an interesting way. The interesting thing about this book is, is that it was written for 
an air conditioning technician that wanted to learn refrigeration. But in my opinion, it honestly covers enough to learn even just basic refrigeration and basic air conditioning. It, it really covers a lot. So, um, I'd say for, and again, I'm going to go off on a tangent. If you can start as a, as an apprentice, if you can start thinking about things differently, when you're look, when you're talking about pressures and what your, your pressure should be in a system, don't really be so concerned about pressures and let's be more concerned about temperatures. Look at saturation temperatures and stop referring to pressures and start referring to saturation temperatures. It really does help you to understand things. Even when I'm on the phone with people and I'm talking to them and they call me and say, Hey, my pressures seem fine. They're at this and this. And I say, okay, but what is your saturation temperatures? What's your vapor sat and what's your liquid sat? And they say, Oh yeah, my vapor sats at 19 degrees. Well, you're working on an air conditioning system and your vapor sat's at 19 degrees. Do you really think that's right? Do you really think that your evaporator should be at 19 degrees? What's your building temperature? What's your return air? What's your wet bulb? You know, if you start to understand saturation temperatures, it starts to make a lot more sense. So if you're working on an air conditioner and you have a saturation temperature um, below 32, we need to start thinking about something, right? Because your air conditioning coil should not be getting below 32 because that's when frost starts to accumulate, right? And air conditioning typically don't have defrost systems built into them. Now, in refrigeration, it's totally expected to see your saturation temperature get below 32 degrees. But on an air conditioner, it's not. So it's that kind of stuff. If you can look at saturation temperatures, you guys are going to excel a lot faster. So, okay. Um, What else? Paul Dieter. I'm going to be honest with you, dude. You couldn't throw a Hillmore manifold at me for free. I wouldn't take it. So, No offense to Hillmore. I've never used one. I've just read too many bad reviews about them, so I won't do it. Um, Chris Lopez, you ask probably one of the biggest questions in here. How important is a well understanding of psychrometrics? Psychrometrics is one of the hardest things to grasp in this trade. And I'm going to be honest with you, most people don't fully grasp it the entire lifespan of the trade. Uh, I understand psychometrics, but I am not an expert in psychometrics. But psychometrics explains everything. If you can understand and grasp the concept of psychometrics, you, you're going to understand everything. It, it just totally makes sense. When you understand the properties of air, when you understand what happens when you add heat to air, when you understand what happens when you remove heat from air, you know, everything, it, it totally makes more sense to everything. I suggest that anybody take as many psychrometrics classes as you can. Every time I take a psychrometrics class, I still learn something else. You know, it's one of those things you're never going to learn at all, but you just got to keep doing it. And psychrometrics, it can be a difficult thing to understand. So, you know, just keep taking them. You're going to pick up a little bit every single time. Um, I recently just took another psychrometrics class. We did an RSCS training class at my local chapter here in Southern California, the Arrowhead chapter. And we had um, Eugene Silberstein, the author of many, many books. He works for the ESCO company. He, um, he wrote the, well, he's a co-author of the Racked Manual. He's written tons of educational books. And he did a psychrometrics class with us. And uh, it was very interesting. Now, I also did a psychrometrics class. Let me think of his name. With another, I'm I'm not even going to try to butcher it because I'm totally forgetting his name right now. But we did another psychrometrics class um, with uh, another guy from RSCS, and it was a great class. So as many as you can take, you know, you're going to learn so much better. So, okay. Um, Where can you find that book, Joel? Uh, You can find it on Amazon. I hope that Amazon's the right place to get that book. You know, a lot of times Amazon hurts people and there's usually better places to get it besides Amazon, but I do know that they sell it on Amazon. Um, but it's, uh, published by a company called Cengage, C E N G A G E, I believe. Um, if you look up Cengage and then look up the book, you'll find out what the best places are to buy that book. You may even be able to buy it direct from Cengage. Um, I would caution you guys to buy stuff from Amazon, uh, because a lot of times, uh, the, the authors and the people that produce the content typically don't get the full credit, but I, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they have arrangements and different things. So, um, but yeah, look up Cengage. They'll tell you where to get, where the best place to get this book is. So what's in the drink. This is uh, apple juice, right? It's bubbly apple juice. <laughs> no, um, we have a local brewery here called hanger hanger 24. And they're uh, um, like a craft brewery. 
here in San Bernardino, California, and they brew. Uh, that is their orange wheat. It's a really, really good uh, kind of like a. It's not a Hefenweizen, but it's a wheat beer, so it's really good. Um. All right, keep going down into here. You guys got more questions? I'll answer them. If not, we're probably going to wrap this up. But keep them coming if you guys got more. So, uh, what is the racked manual? Uh, it's refrigeration and air conditioning technology. They call it the racked manual. R A C T. So it's refrigeration and air conditioning technologies. Um, I don't have one anymore. I used to, but yeah, I don't have one to show you, but you could just look it up. Okay. Okay. Chris, nothing to do with, uh, what at now, you know, 43 RCTXV is 507. I don't know what you're asking there, Pablo. Can you rephrase that, bud? Okay. Someone messaging me right now? Oh, yeah. Seeing what I'm missing here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do a hangout again, Gary. I've done them before. Uh, we could probably do one again. Um, it's been a while. But, yeah, we can probably set up one of these nights. We can do a hangout maybe on a Saturday night or something, and then I could talk to you guys face-to-face. -face. I'm good with that. We'll have to do that one of these times. Um, okay, let me keep going down in here. Do I have any experience with chillers? No, I don't. So you, uh, Ty, you said you work on chill water systems for manufacturer. Do you have any experience with chillers? That's mostly what you work on based in Riverside, California. No, I don't do any water chillers. I don't do any chiller work. I'm, I'm mostly light commercial refrigeration and air conditioning. So I do restaurant stuff, ice machines, refrigerators, walk-ins, exhaust fans, all that good stuff. So, okay. So. Uh, prime time. You said a lot of mechanics use the wrong size liquid line. They never thought of looking at the opening of the orifice of three eighths as the most common liquid line, which is wrong. Um, I don't know where you're going with that prime time, but you do bring something into my head and I want to talk about it a little bit. Understanding what flow rates are in refrigeration is very important. And uh, had one, well, I didn't have it today, but I have come across this before. Just because, and I don't know what you, if this was what you were alluding to primetime or not, but you kind of gave me an idea, but just because a line size is one. So let's say you have a three eighths liquid line. Okay. And it's going all the way down to the TXV and you want to put on a liquid line solenoid valve. Okay. What I want to get at is, is you don't size that solenoid valve by the line size. The line size goes out the door. Okay. What you size the solenoid valve by is the flow rate of the refrigerant or the tonnage, okay? So it's possible, depending on the type of solenoid valve, that if you have a big enough system, it'll never let that solenoid valve shut because the pressure is pushing so hard through that system, okay? So you got to understand flow rates. Same thing goes with uh, dryers. If you're putting on a liquid dryer on a system that has... Uh, you know, that that's too small. You, you basically, so if you just size the liquid dryer just because it's three eighths, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right size. What you need to do is on the box of the liquid dryer or the literature, you need to read it and see what the horsepower and what the tonnage of refrigerant that uh, liquid dryer could let pass through it at the same time. So it's very important to understand that you don't size via the lines. Same thing if you're running um, refrigeration lines, let's say you're doing a walk-in unit and uh, you've got a, a condensed unit on the roof that it's a pre-made condensed unit and it has a 7 8 and a 3 8 stub coming out of it. That doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the line size going down, okay? It all depends on the pressure drop in the system, how the line sets ran. So you can't just assume things. You need to understand the proper sequence of operation of things and you need to understand how refrigerant flows and all that stuff, okay? So um I get a lot of questions from people that just get out of school and they decide to start their own business and then they're lost because they just assume that this is how you do things. That's not how it goes. So, okay. Gary, good seeing you, man. We'll talk to you later. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do a video on truck stock, Joel. Um, and, and we could talk about that and I could let you guys know what, what kind of truck stock I keep and stuff. Um, I'm probably going to end this guys because, uh, yeah, that's, that's really important is the psychrometrics total tech. It's very important, but I'm probably going to end this guys because it's dinner time for me. So, um, 
I am going to let you guys go and uh, send me emails if you guys have questions. I saw some emails already come through and uh, I will uh, talk to you guys a little bit later. Okay. Thanks again so much for coming on here and watching me and uh, being patient with my audio problems that popped up in the middle of the stream. And I will catch you guys on the next one. Okay. Again, send me emails, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Uh, what do I think about the new HFO refrigerants? Um, I will cover that at another time, Ty. Okay. So, uh, yeah, again, send me emails guys. I'll, I'll answer all your guys' questions. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and end this and we will, uh, talk to you guys. Let me see. No, that's not right. Okay. We will talk to you guys later. Okay.